and good morning. It is a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, I, like you, certainly miss Greg and his absence, and I'm grateful that he's willing to go so far away to preach God's Word and to help the people in Malawi. And you're stuck with me, but the good, that's the bad news. The good news is you won't be stuck with me for long, so just bear with me. We've got three passages to read this morning, and I hope we can make one solid application from those three passages and be better off for having spent some time in God's Word this morning. I'm going to make one major assumption <clears throat> that I'm not the only one who has been a little overwhelmed with the news cycles of the last six or eight months. <clears throat> that I'm not the only one who probably watches too much news on TV and consumes too much news in other, from other places. I don't do social media, but I, I, I would be... Um, I would be pulled down that rabbit hole too if I allowed myself. And I'm going to assume that I'm not the only one who's a little bent around the axle and concerned and anxious about the upcoming election. Far more so than I should be. And the more news that I watch or read, the more helpless I feel about the direction of our country. I know I'm not the only one. Nick has shared this in a, in a sermon he preached several months ago. I've talked to several of you about it. And so I know you share with some of my anxieties. In fact, if you can envision in your mind maybe a speedometer that goes from zero to 60. And zero is just being conscious of what's going on. It's just this jumping off spot, just kind of knowing what's happening. And it moves from being engaged to being concerned and from concern to anxiety and from anxiety to frustration and frustration to anger. All, you get it all the way to the right and, and we're in anger mode. And I have to admit that I've spent too much of my time in the last six or eight months in that frustration to anger mode about where we're headed and what we're doing. And my children called me on it a few Weeks ago, months ago, Dad, why are you watching so much news? And I didn't have a good answer for that. Because the more news that I watch, again, the more, the more fruitless it seems, and the more helpless I feel about where we're going. So my response was to, was to spend a little more time in God's Word, hopefully, and less time in the news cycle. And I turned to three of my favorite prayers because they address three of my major anxieties about where we're at and where we're headed. The three anxieties that worry me are the wars and rumors of wars that are all over our globe, right? We've got a globe that's on fire. We have a war in the Middle East. We have potential wars in the Far East. And we have a war in Europe, all of which our nation has ties to and we could be pulled into those wars at any minute. I don't want that for our generation. I certainly don't want that for my children. <clears throat> the second thing that concerns me to a great degree, to a much greater degree even than the previous, is just the pagan world that we live in, pagan nation that we've become. The fact that we live in a world where we refuse, not that we can't, but we refuse to define a man from a woman, the fact that we live in a world where we refuse to admit what we've known since the dawn of time, that there really are only two genders, and the fact that we continue on a daily basis to sacrifice children in abortion at a rate of 85,000 children a month. That sounds like we live in the days of Baal and Dagon and Molech, sacrificing children. What a pagan nation we have become. But the third thing that concerns me the most, and probably is at the root of all of that, is that we've just become a godless nation, right? We've done everything we can to remove God from our consciousness. That is all by design, all on purpose. And it makes all the rest of it easier for those who want God out. <clears throat> but I, there's nothing new under the sun. All of these things have been going on since the dawn of time. And God's people have dealt with them. And God's, the, the, the men and women across time who have prepared their heart to seek God 
continue to fight these battles. Let's read about one of those. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. <clears throat> one of my favorite men of the Old Testament is a really obscure one to most of us probably. King Jehoshaphat, one of my favorite kings. He wasn't perfect. He wasn't the best king, but he was a really good king. He had a great heart. Multiple times the Bible says that he, he set his heart to seek God. And yes, he made mistakes. He allied himself with the wrong people at different times. But he tried really, really hard. And he finds himself at the doorstep of war. One of the three great anxieties that I have. And let's see how he responded and the prayer that he prayed uh, around that. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Read with me, beginning with verse 1. And it happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against King Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, by the way. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are at Hazazon Tamar, which is En Gedi, which is, by the way, just across the Jordan River. They're less than a day's march away. Look at what Jehoshaphat did, verse 3. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord, and from all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court, and he said, this is the part I really need. If you don't hear anything else I say today, just listen to these three prayers that we're going to read today. Here's Jehoshaphat's prayer. O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, If disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save us. And now, here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned, but turned from them and did not destroy them. Here they are, rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. What an amazing way to deal with concerns about war. Just turn to God, recognize how powerless we are, and ask God to take over. Recognize that he rules in the kingdoms of men. And of course, God answered his prayer. We won't take the time to read the rest of chapter 21, but you would find that God answered his prayer. He turned the battle between the Ammonites and the Moabites against each other, and they destroyed each other for God's sake. Second... The second concern I had is about the paganism of our country. Let's read a prayer about that. Turn with me in your Bible just a few pages over to Ezra chapter 9. <clears throat> Ezra chapter 9. You all know the story that the children of Israel have been in captivity <clears throat> and they have returned. Um, Nehemiah led them to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, Zerubbabel has come back and led them in the building of the temple. Ezra came along at the tail end of that to, to help make sure it, it, was, it was completed and to teach the law to the people. And yet Ezra comes back and finds that Israel has fallen back in to the same paganism that got them into Babylon to begin with. And he is destroyed by that. Let's read, beginning in verse 1. Um, 
The words of Ezra chapter 9, verse 1. When these things were done, the leaders came to me saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the land. With respect to the abominations of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, so that the holy seed is mixed with the peoples of those lands. Indeed, the, ha indeed, the hand of the leaders and rulers has been foremost in this trespass. So when I heard this thing, I tore my garment and my robe and plucked out some of the hair of my head and my beard, and I sat down astonished. Then, then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel assembled to me because of the transgression of those who had been carried away captive, and I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. At the evening sacrifice I arose from my fasting, having torn my garment and my robe, and I fell upon my knees. I spread out my hands to the Lord my God, and I said... And again, I just call your attention. If you hear nothing, listen to the words of this prayer. Oh my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you. My God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has grown up to the heavens. Since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been very guilty. And for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to sword, to captivity, to plunder, and to humiliation as it is this day. And now, for a little while, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant, to escape, and to give us a peg in this holy place, that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a measure of revival in our bondage. For we were slaves, yet God did not forsake us in our bondage, but he extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to revive us, to repair the house of our God, to rebuild its ruins, and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. And now, O oh our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, The land which you are that you are entering to possess is an unclean land, with the uncleanness of the, of the peoples of the lands, and their, and their abominations which have filled it from one end to another with its impurity. Now, therefore, do not give your daughters as wives for their sons, nor take their daughters to your sons and never seek their peace or prosperity that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it as an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, since you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserve and have given us such deliverance as this, should we again Break your commandments and join in marriage with the people committing these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you had consumed us so that there would be no remnant or survivor? O oh Lord God of Israel, you are righteous, for we are left as a remnant as it is this day. Here we are before you in our guilt, though no one can stand before you because of this. What an amazing prayer of Ezra pouring out his heart to God over the sins and the iniquities of his people. And again, we won't take the time to read chapter 10, but God goes into work immediately in response to the faithful prayer of a man who set his heart to seek God. And Shechaniah and others stand up and confirm Ezra's words, and the people move. They take action to cleanse themselves of the paganism of their land. The third and most alarming concern I have is just how we have excluded God from our nation, carved him out in every possible way. And I'm going to ask you to turn to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. 
Daniel speaks an incredibly beautiful prayer in Daniel chapter 9. He has been, as godly people have a tendency to do, pouring himself into God's word. He's been studying from the book of Jeremiah. He recognizes that the 70 years of captivity are just about over. And um, he springs into action to prepare for that. And so let's read John, uh, excuse me, Daniel chapter 9. And especially pay attention to the prayer that Daniel prays on behalf of his people. In the first year, uh, Daniel 9 verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word through Jeremiah the prophet. That he would accomplish 70 years of desolations of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make, re make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, here's the part to listen to. O Lord, great and awesome God, who keep his covenant and his mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and to all the people of the land. O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you. But to us, shame of face as it is this day. To the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those near and those far off, and all the countries to which you have driven them, because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O oh Lord, to us belongs shame of face. To our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against Him, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in His laws, which He set before us by His servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed Your law and has departed so as not to obey Your voice. Therefore, the curse... And the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us great disaster. For under the whole earth, such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law, of the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now... O oh Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O oh Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. 
Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. What an amazing prayer to pray over your nation because of the direction that he feared they would go. <clears throat> All three of these prayers, if, if, if it were a rag and you could wring it, the faith would be dripping from it, right? The emotion, the appeal to God would be dripping from these prayers. Because these men feared the direction of their country, as you and I may fear and be anxious about the direction of our country. <clears throat> if you will, let's join together and let's pray for our country. Uh, let's not go through the motions, but 270 people, whatever's in this auditorium, Let's pour our hearts out to God right now over our country. Let's put our faith and trust in the God who rules in the kingdoms of men. Let's pray. O oh Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And you not rule over the kingdoms of the nations. And in your hand is there not power and might, so that no one is able to withstand you. O oh, our God, we are too ashamed and humiliated to lift up our face to you, our God. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has grown up to the heavens. O oh, Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, to our leaders, to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against him, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in your statutes and your laws which you have set before us. Lord God, we pray that you would protect our sons and daughters from war. We pray, Lord, that you would return us to a belief in God Almighty. We pray, Lord, that we would put away the pagan acts that are pervasive in our society, that we would value life, and we pray, Lord, that you would extend the freedoms and liberties of our country to our children and to our children's children, if it be your will, Lord. But we acknowledge, Lord, that you are King of kings, that you are Lord of lords, and we pray that your will would be done. Lord, we do not ask these blessings because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies, Lord. Help us, Lord, to put our faith and our trust in the Christ who is raised from the dead, who you set far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come, Father. Help us to put our faith and trust in you, O oh God, to lead our country in the right direction. Lord, we pray that as we acknowledge you in all of our ways, you would guide our every step. In the name, the powerful name, Father, of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. You know what's interesting about each of these three men? In 2 Chronicles chapter 22 and verse 9, it is said of Jehoshaphat that he sought the Lord with all of his heart. In Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8, a passage we're pretty familiar with, we find that Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the king's delicacies. Y'all remember that story. But it took an action on Daniel's heart. He prepared his heart for that. Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10 says that Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach it, its statutes and ordinances in Israel. These three men, I mean... There, there's not a lot of men in, in Scripture that it says that their hearts were right. 
But each of these three men, the Bible says that about them. I believe that when I, when I read their prayers. I guess the question for you at the conclusion of this sermon is, has your heart been prepared? Is your heart aligned with Christ? And if it's not, that can be fixed right here and right now. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you're, if you're willing to repent and turn from your sins, to confess your faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior, you can be baptized into Christ, be united with Him in death, raised to walk a new life, a different life, and be able to pour your heart out to God and expect that He hears. And when you're anxious and concerned about the direction of our country or something else, God will hear your prayer. If you're subject to our invitation this morning, we would ask you to come as Adam leads us in invitation song.